Welcome to Vancouver Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. Today, Pat Iyer is training us on writing a book to gain credibility. Pat, I've got a couple of questions for you so that we can get to know you on more of a personal level. My first question is uh, uh, about your first book. How did that situation ever come to pass that you wrote your first book? You know, it's a hard transition to go from never having written a book to having a book that's published. That's the zero to one. And every other book after that is easier, Roger. I was working as a staff development educator in an acute care hospital in New Jersey a couple of other of my colleagues were asked to create workbooks for teaching a new concept in nursing. And we realized we all had the same responsibility. Why not get together and write this together and co-author it? We ended up creating what in the 80s was called a self-learning module. It would be a workbook or a handbook. We used that very successfully and then thought maybe we could get it published. The first publisher told us it was too skeletal and needed to be fleshed out and turned into a textbook. And we said, oh, that's too much work. We can't do that. And we went to a second publisher and the second publisher said, yes, it's great material, but it's too skeletal. You need to flesh it out, turn it into a textbook, and then we can sell it in schools of nursing. So we decided to listen to that advice and that became the first book. Wow. And that was published in uh, 1986. Those were the days. The world has changed in book publishing ever since then, hasn't it? But, but, it has. It oh. has, certainly. Okay, second question is this. Uh, what opportunity? I know since then, since those early days, you've written many books and you've edited uh, or been instrumental in supporting people write their books. But specific to the books you have written, what uh, opportunities have actually arisen as a direct result of the books that you have written? The first book that I wrote, the, which was called Nursing Diagnosis and Nursing Process, enabled me to approach attorneys and say to them that I could be an expert witness for them on their cases. I wanted to testify about nursing malpractice cases. And the fact that I had written that book gave me credibility and authority that was appealing to the attorneys who were looking for expert witnesses. And I found out about expert witnesses by going to an educational program about new career paths for nurses. I really had no idea up to that point that nurses testified in court. Over my career, I've averaged about 200 to 250 an hour for the work that I did as an expert witness. And those cases add up early and, or quickly in terms of hours. It could be 10, 20, 30 hours of work on a case over the lifetime of that lawsuit. That gave me the opportunity to develop my testifying skills. And then one day an attorney said to me, I have an emergency department case, can you review it? I said, I'm not an emergency room nurse, but I have a colleague who is. I called her, she was interested, she, hired, she was hired by him. And then I sat back as, as I'm sure many people listening have all of a sudden got an insight that said, hmm, how could that lead to further work? It turned out that there was a very uh, viable market for providing well-qualified expert witnesses, which I did for the next 26 years. And that turned into a very large company that I was able to sell six years ago this month. Wow. I had no idea expert witnesses got paid that amount of money. Those are for nurses. Uh, doctors get paid even more. <laughs> okay, lovely. Thanks for sharing that with us, Pat. Uh, participants, uh, bear in mind that you will be sent a link to the recording of this talk in a few hours. <clears throat> but notwithstanding that, I still encourage you to take notes anyway, uh, because the simple act of taking notes will increase what you absorb uh, by as much as 30%.
Pat, are you ready to rock the stage? I am. Then step one is for you to uh, share screen, get your slides going, and I will spotlight you. Okay. You are now spotlighted. Okay. Um, and slides over when to you. I'm sharing my screen, it's showing me my, even though I have um, the slides highlighted, Roger, under the advanced feature, it's still showing my um, computer rather than the slides. So let me go back to the basic version since we know that works. And how about now? Are you seeing my slides? Uh, yeah, perfectly. And I, I don't think you should be using the advanced version. You should just be using basic. Anyway, back to you. Slides work. Good. Show is now yours. All right. So what I'm not seeing is my ability to click on slideshow to show you the full screen slides, but you can see them on the screen. How about if we just accept that that's what our um, Bottom. The world is giving us today. So go down to the bottom right corner where you see uh, to the go to the right, to the right, to the right. Display settings. No, there is a cup shape extreme right. Right, 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 right. Oh, okay. Too far. Well, too, right. go a little bit to the left. A little bit to the left. No, 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 no. That, there you go. Oh, yeah, this one. Wow, thank you. That's perfect. I didn't know you could get there that way. All right, so you're seeing my screens now in full view? Yes, perfect. Excellent, excellent, all right. And Roger, you're admitting people? I'm doing the admit job. Perfect, perfect. You don't have to. I shared just a few minutes ago how I got involved in doing expert witness work and did that for the next 26 years as a result of having co-authored my first book. My life changed in ways that I couldn't imagine. And that's one of the messages that I wanna share with you is that when you write a book, it opens up doors that you don't know exist and gives you the opportunity to make connections with the people who are interested in what you have to say. I suggest before you write a book that you think about what is your objective. As strategically as possible, pick a topic that is going to lead to new opportunities and ways to share your knowledge. And at the end of this program, I will be giving you a link to a free ebook that I put together with some tips on how you can smooth out your writing. You can use that when you're writing articles or blogs or creating books. Roger mentioned I've written many books. The first book that I would describe to you before we started the slides was a book on the nursing process. I decided to take all my books off my bookshelf and take this picture. Uh, this is in the house that I'm sitting in right now. And my original thought before I thought about the effect of gravity was that I would put all of them in one stack and then stand next to it but once I got to the left stack, they started to tip over and hit the blinds behind the stack of books. So I created two stacks. These are, as you can see, a combination of textbooks, which are the bigger, fatter, hardcover books, and then many books that I independently published. And some, like I have my cursor on this one, were translated into Japanese. That first book was translated into Spanish and also into Portuguese. I know that you've been to networking events and probably to VBN networking events if you're close enough to where Roger is sitting now to have attended those sessions in person when they were occurring. And you got a stack of business cards. I'd like you to put in the chat if you have gotten a stack of business cards and they're sitting in a drawer or in a box waiting for that time when you'll have a chance to go through them or put them into a database. If you've had that experience, just put yes in the chat and that will let me know if I'm not the only person who has ended up with a stack of cards 
that one day when you have time, you're going to end up processing and following up on. Uh, and yes, uh, Douglas says, I file some. Life pleasure says, yes. All right, so you're familiar with this concept. Think about what it's like when somebody hands you a book. You don't put that in a box or in a drawer. You put that on your bookcase. You open it up and you read it. You remember that person more solidly because you have that book in your hands. One of the questions that people ask me is, what does it take to get rich from books? Is your intention when you write a book to be able to expect that you're gonna make lots of money on royalties and you'll just be sitting back, not having to work? The reality is that you can increase your income from writing a book, but my focus in this program is not on how you create and generate a lot of royalties, but what are the doors and the opportunities that open to you because you've written that book? Warren Buffett is the third most wealthy person in the world with a net worth of 88.75 billion as of the most recent figures. And he says that one easy way to become worth 50% or more than you are right now is to hone your communication skills, both written and verbal. When you write a book and you are using your knowledge, you're communicating to people in a way that they are wired to receive. You can take that content and turn it into an audiobook, turn it into a podcast, turn it into blogs. So you are making your information available in written form, in um, audio form. And you, of course, also can create videos out of your book content. You can change your lives. I, this book, which I've been mentioning, changed my life in ways that I didn't expect. You can think of books that you have read that have changed your life, ones that are so memorable to you that years later, you're still thinking about the concepts or the imagery in that book. Having written a book often leads to promotions. If you're working in a corporate environment, more attention to your capabilities, raising your fees if you're an independent business owner. And when you are competing with other people, you have that opportunity to get an advantage if you are involved in the speaking world, uh, as I am, I often hear people say that having written a book gives them the opportunity to speak on that stage, either live or virtually, over somebody who has not written a book. One of the people I've worked with, Ricardo Vargas, is in Portugal. He started his life as a family therapist, and one day, he finally realized he had to walk away from that field. He was working with a family who had a six-year-old boy who was very dysfunctional. And the therapy team tried all kinds of approaches and they couldn't cure this boy. He decided because he's a sensitive guy, he just couldn't do this anymore. It really wrecked him. A friend of his said, you know, I'm working with a company and it's very dysfunctional. There's personality clashes, there's hidden agendas, there's jockeying for power. They really need somebody like a therapist who would come in and help them. And that created R Ricardo's new business, which he's been doing for 20 years. This book, which we just finished ghostwriting is gonna be released next week. This is gonna give him tremendous visibility and authority with the CEOs who are in a position to hire him to work with their companies. You meet new people when you write a book. Think about, you can connect with people online, you can connect with people offline in networking events, but your book goes out to people you would never meet in person or online. They contact you, they want your services, they want help, they wanna follow up with you. When you have a deep, knowledge base on a topic, it gives you the opportunity to influence other people. 
Some people write books because they're thought leaders. They want to fix a problem. They understand the solution. They want to help other people. This woman, Cindy Hartnett, hired me to edit her book, which had been stimulated by an experience that she had. She was sitting with her husband on the top of a mountain in a Boy Scout camp. She had driven up to the mountain to retrieve him and his son from his first marriage. He leaned over, said to her, my chest is hurting me, fell off the chair and died. She did CPR. They were 45 minutes up the mountain from an ambulance from the nearest town. So at the age of 34, she was a widow with her 37 year old husband. She wrote a book about her experiences of what happened on that mountain, how it changed her life, how she was in no way prepared at 34 to be able to handle the bank account, the investments, to straighten out all the details that go along with assuming being in charge of the estate of a person. And that turned into her speaking career. Um, on the back of her book, she writes that she is available to speak about finding the solutions within, moving through grief and getting unstuck. She became a successful speaker due to the visibility from this book. So pulling this together, you can sell your services faster and easier because you have that visibility, that authority, the respect that people give you because you've taken the, the time to put your ideas and your knowledge into a book. And it leads to media attention. The media have this hungry machine that has to be filled 24 hours a day, they are thinking about stories that they need to bring into their news programs, whether online live or on the internet. They turn to the people who've written books. And I'm sure without a doubt that you have watched a news program in which the little video says, and here comes John Smith, the author of the forthcoming book, dealing with change in a traumatic time John, let's talk about your book. John, what's your opinion on XYZ? The media find that's like the easy way to find guests. Diana Booher is a, a person who has built a business on teaching corporations about communication skills. She works with Fortune 100 companies and generated her business as a result of her first nonfiction business book. Her books are all about writing skills and communication. And she has to date at this point written at least 50 books, probably another couple since I checked in with her last. 78% of her clients come to her because of her books. That's a huge source of exposure. You may have heard of Jay Conrad Levinson who put together the Guerrilla Marketing Series. He has lots, he had, he is deceased. He had his first book, Guerrilla Marketing, and that spawned Guerrilla Public Relations, Guerrilla Exhibiting, a, a whole series of books on that topic. Somebody asked him how much he made. The answer he gave was 10 million. He got 35,000 in royalties. Now that is an impressive number. I like, I would like 35,000 in royalties. I would love a check like that. However, the rest of it was speaking engagements, spin-off books, meaning other books that were in the series, newsletters, columns, boot camps, consulting, the doors that opened to him that made up the difference. So I would like to ask you a question on what do you want to get from writing a book? What's your motivation? And I'd like you to put that in the chat. And, and Doug is pointing out, yes, um, royalties of 35,000 mean that you're selling a tremendous number of books. Most people would never achieve $35,000 in royalties. Um, if you are Michelle Obama or 
marry Trump and you sell millions of books, you get a huge payload. But for the average author, royalties are not something that you should count on to pay your bills. So great point, Doug, thank you. And Doug is saying uh, he's interested in writing a book to create boot camps and courses. Online courses are a great thing to be able to get as a result of putting your content together and repurposing it for a higher income opportunity. Marilla wants to change how we value teens. Ah, and it sounds like there's a story behind that statement, Marilla. So I, I would love to sit down and talk with you about that passion. And I'll continue on while you're adding some more comments. Uh, Life Pleasure says sharing knowledge courses on various topics. Those are things that easily flow from the work that you put into writing a book. One of the ways that helps you narrow down your topic is to think about who is your ideal reader? Who is the person that you're trying to reach? Uh, maybe in Marilla's case, it might be the parents of the teenagers, for example. Maybe they're her target market. Uh, John Cunningham says helping others, making more money, networking, having fun, those are the reasons why he would like to write a book. And Doug says he's got his target market nailed down. Professionals over the age of 50. When you create a client avatar or an ideal reader avatar, and I'm using those two expressions interchangeably, you're saying that your ideal reader is John Jones. He's 54 years old. He's interested in creating a business for himself using his skills and building on his knowledge, for example. You go on in more detail than that. And then when you're writing your book, you're focusing on that ideal reader. You're looking at that person's profile. Some people take a picture, a royalty-free picture, a picture you have on your computer or camera and put it right next to their laptop so that they're writing and they're looking at that client avatar and it helps them to stay focused. I'd also like you to put in the chat, what are some of the problems that your book that you're thinking about writing solves for your ideal client? How is it gonna help them overcome those problems and achieve their goals? And I, I see that life's pleasures put helps other people with my experience. So she's probably got a very specific idea in mind of people who would be those that would listen to those problems, who would be experiencing them. Mike has a specific goal also to change the attitude in the software testing and quality assurance in the software development industry. You can see that's a very specific niche and it sounds like if I had to guess that Mike's got a great background experience in that field, perhaps is working in that field now and knows what are the challenges that those individuals are dealing with. I'm looking at some other responses. And Natalie is thinking about ideas for two books. And Natalie, you'll, you'll wanna pay attention to what I cover a little bit later when I talk about what happens if you have ideas for two books. One is to help others. Natalie says the other is a prong for what she would like to create as a business. There are four big buckets when you think about your topic. And these are the ways that people tend to draw from their experiences and thinking about what is the thing that I wanna write about. This exercise is what's critical to help you get started in your book. And that's to basically take an inventory. Do you wanna write based on your occupation? As I suspect that Mike is in the IT field, that would be a content that would be driven from where he works, what he knows best. Some people write books because they have a passion for a topic. They're looking for a specific 
way to share their interest, their deep interest in that particular content. Some people write books based on their knowledge. They are looking at what they've learned best, what they've had the most experience doing with their business, what they have gathered from their research. And then there are others who write books based on their hobbies and interests. The writing a book about your memoir or your experiences, what you've learned as a result of your life's challenges and trials, which we all have, that fits more in the passion category. I've gone through this difficult experience. How can I help you when you're struggling with the same issue? Pamela Rashid went through a course that I taught on writing a book and she had two ideas. She said to me, Pat, I left my abusive husband, got on a plane with my two kids and flew to the United States not knowing a soul. I had no contacts here. I had no job. I had no place to live. I was a nurse in my country. That was my skill. I would like to inspire people who are caught up in difficult experiences to be able to leave that person, leave that environment and get away. Going to another country is an extreme way to solve that problem. And it saved her. She used her nursing skills to get a job as an infertility nurse working in Columbia University in their infertility clinic. She had a passion about what she had done to help couples achieve their goals of having a baby. So she said, which do I write first? And we went through some questions. First of all, what was the most strategic thing for her career? She wanted to share both topics. It's difficult to write two books at the same time. I recommend that you choose one of them. You choose and, and finish one before moving on to the next. Which one can you write the fastest? Is there a topic that you have in mind where you've got a lot of the information already? Maybe you've blogged on the topic. Maybe you've taught courses on the topic. Maybe you have a podcast on the topic. Maybe you've written articles. You can gather that information and repurpose it in order to be able to put a book together fast. And which one are you going to finish? You would be horrified if you knew how many people have started books and they're sitting there on their hard drive, not finished. Maybe I'm describing you. You'll get it done one day. Oh, it's not the right time. I would like you to pick a topic that you will get through, you will finish so that you can get it out into the hands of other people. And which idea makes you the happiest? Which is the topic that you would love to be able to explore? It's fun to be able to talk about. You enjoy the process of writing about it. You like learning more and going deeper into the subject. What Pamela decided to do was to write her book about her experience on infertility. We were together on December 31st, uh, 14 days ago, 15 days ago, uploading her book onto Amazon. It has been on Amazon for 14 days. It already has a rank in the hundred thousands. There are millions of books on Amazon. This means that of all the books on Amazon, her book is selling in the hundred thousands. Picking the topic also means thinking about what is your ideal reader going to find most interesting and valuable? Of all the things that you could write about, what are the things that are going to help you sell your books because you're speaking to the needs of your ideal reader? And you don't have to guess about this. This is one of the nice things about being connected to people. You can ask your ideal reader for feedback about your idea. You're ideally picking between five or six people, ideally at least five people, and you're talking to them about your topic. What would they love to see in your book? 
when I say ideally five, I think that's the minimum. I have a podcast called Writing to Get Business, and I interviewed a man who had 250 people that he went to while he was writing his book to get feedback. And you may be thinking, wow, 250 people, that's a lot. Well, think about the brilliance of it. Now that his book is done and he's launching his book, he goes back to those 250 people and say, first of all, he asked them to buy a copy in order to give him feedback. So he already had pre-sales of 250 books, $20 for a book. Well, that adds up. That's nice. And then he says, all right, now you've got this book. I'm launching this book. Let's talk about having your review on Amazon. Let's talk about the people you know in your life who would be interested in this book. In the beta stage, when you're thinking about your idea, then you're asking also, what are the challenges that you have regarding that topic? And those answers help to form the content as you're writing the book. And then you ask them, what would you want to learn about the topic? Again, keeping track of their answers so that you are addressing those as you're doing the writing. And then here's my outline. Does anything seem to be missing? We think that we're objective about our content. The reality is that often we're too close to it to see what somebody wants in your book and you're blind to it. You might think, well, I don't have to include that because everybody knows that. Well, they don't. Or it never occurred to me to write about that component. Your readers, your ideal readers, your beta readers, uh, this group of people who act as your think tank help you develop the content. And then you can revise your ideas. I'd like to go through some of the types of publishing options next. Often people are confused about how they should publish their book. Should they independently publish it? Should they go to a traditional publisher? Should they use a hybrid publisher? And I just wanna check the messages first to see if anyone has put any questions or comments in that I have overlooked. No, looks like we are up to date. Perfect. The types of publishing options fit into those three categories. First of all, the traditional publisher. You get a contract from that traditional publisher. The publisher handles all of the printing, the editing, the distribution, the marketing. That used to be one of the only games in town. The traditional publisher to this day, requires that you create your ideas in the form of a book proposal and that you have an agent who has reviewed your book proposal and has seen merit in the idea and is willing to represent you in approaching traditional publishers. Traditional publishers are inundated with unsolicited manuscripts and in the old days when they came in in paper form, probably still do, but some of them are submitted electronically, you can envision an inbox with stacks and stacks and stacks of book proposals. That's why agents are the go-betweens based on their relationship with the publishing company. They are the filter and they know who to call up to say, I've got a book that I think is in your genre and that you would be interested in. The publisher pays the agent through your royalties. You don't have to pay that person a flat fee, but it gets subtracted from what you would receive because the agent needs to be compensated. And then the publisher is saying, all right, the agent submitted the proposal. What kind of platform does this author have? The platform is equated to how are you going to promote this book? Who are you connected to on social media? How many social media connections do you have? Are you a speaker? Are you gonna be teaching people in person or virtually and then selling your book as part of the compensation that you receive as a speaker? 
What are you doing in terms of visibility? Do you have a video channel? Do you have a podcast? Do you have a blog? How are you going to promote this? And if you don't have those things, or the numbers are not impressive enough, the publisher may not be interested in your book, no matter how valid the content. It used to be that the publishers provided you with 10 to 12% royalty and they handled all expenses. I had a conversation with a man about hmm, a year ago, 18 months ago, who told me that as a new author, he approached one of the traditional publishers and the publisher said, yes, you got a great idea, but you're unknown. You and your partner who've written, who wanna write this book don't have any reputation and you have no experience as authors. So we want you to give us $50,000 to help market this book. They decided that they would independently publish the book rather than to make that kind of investment. Other than the traditional publishers, the only other option in town was to go to a vanity press, which means that you pay the press to take on your project. They will provide you with an editor, they provide you with a cover, they provide you with some marketing, and it varies greatly. The costs vary greatly. The motivation behind the vanity press is to obtain income from writers. They're not particularly interested in selling your book. They want you to invest in them through a detailed contract. I met a woman who said she had to sign a 40 page contract and there was one paragraph on one of those pages. She didn't understand the significance of that. It ended up costing her a great deal of money to go through that. And I've heard many stories like that. They may do minimal editing, proofreading and cover design or not. They may all be add-ons. So if you choose the route of a vanity press, then be very clear in advance of knowing what the costs are. Hybrid publishers also fit into this world or small publishers, they may all ask for an investment from the author. It's extremely important that you know what this is gonna cost you and you know all the costs in advance rather than to be surprised. You might be partway through the project and not realize the implications. And then finally, the third option, which is the most popular option statistically at this point is to do independent publishing or self-publishing. In independent publishing, you find a person like Letitia who will do the cover design for you. And thank you for that, Letitia, for that note. Uh, some people think they can design covers and they think they're graphic artists, but they don't produce anything that looks professional. So it's important to rely on the skills of somebody who has that eye. When you independently publish, then you control every stage. That's both a pro and a con. It's a pro because you can move through the process much more quickly than a traditional publisher. That you remember that stack of textbooks I showed you in the beginning of this program, those hardbound books took months and months and months to put together. Typically it can take six months to a year for a book to work its way through the process from the point that it is accepted to the point that it's published. And you know, some of the content could have changed in that year. That uh, slow pace is not present when you independently publish. When I say it's also a con that you control every stage, it means that you need to do or subcontract out the phases that a traditional publisher would do for you. You should have a professional editor you should have a professional cover design. You should have a layout artist who will create the physical or the, the digital files that will look professional once your book is independently published. So it's you who's in charge. And then the people that support you are the layout artist, the cover designer, the editor, so that you can then take advantage of the print on demand platforms. 
The largest one is Amazon. Print on demand is, if you've ever seen a print on demand book, and actually the one that I showed you earlier, at the end of the book, it says, made in the USA, Columbia, South Carolina. You know this, this book was a print on demand, which means that when somebody places an order for it, it's literally printed. They don't keep any big stock of books sitting on a warehouse. It is done at that time. And as an Amazon author, you can order one copy of your book. You can order 17. You don't have any minimum number that you are obligated to buy, which is not the case for the vanity or hybrid publishers where you might be expected to purchase 500 copies of your book as part of the contract. And then you can also turn the book if you're uploading to Amazon to Kindle Direct Publishing, you can turn that into a Kindle book or an audio book. They own both of those platforms. I did some research with people not long ago and I asked them about their fears or their concerns. What's holding you back? Why do you have an idea for a book and yet you're concerned you haven't moved forward? Because we can create obstacles for ourselves in all kinds of ways. You may have, like I do, you know, the little inner critic in your head that says, hmm, is this a good idea? When I did my research, I asked, what is your biggest fear? What is your biggest frustration? And what's your biggest challenge regarding writing a book? And what I heard were a variety of responses. One of them was fear of failure. What if this book is no good? What if people don't want to buy it? Now, there are ways to deal with those fears. I've shared with you one a few minutes ago about getting some beta readers involved. That's one way to deal with that fear of failure so that you know that you're writing content that your audience wants rather than to get all the way through this process and then find that this book is not working. Another is the fear of the unknown. I've shared with you some information about some of the traps associated, particularly with vanity press, with hybrid publishers. You might, if you've never been involved with that type of publishing company, you might not even realize that those nuances exist that it's important to read that contract thoroughly and to know all the implications about what might be hidden in that contract. So that fear that I've just shared with you, you may not even have come into this program this morning thinking about that as a potential trap. Sometimes it's not being familiar with the process. Oh, it seems so complicated. When I helped Pamela Rashid put her book on um, Amazon on December 31st on infertility. She said, well, how much is Amazon gonna cost, charge me for keeping my book on the platform? There is no charge. You get paid royalties based on the sales, but you don't have to pay to upload your book. They want your book. They want you to upload that book so that they can sell it and they can make their money. They can make their 60% on every paperback book or 70% that are, I'm sorry, numbers are reversed. They make 40% on your paperback book. They make 30% on your Kindle book, provided you price that book within their guidelines. Another fear is that you may wonder if you've got the best writing skills. You may be very confident in your writing skills and people have told you all your life, you know, you're a good writer. You might be in the opposite camp where you think, hmm, writing doesn't come easily to me. By working with a professional editor, for example, you can deal with those, those fears and make sure that your book is well done and represents you well. And I would bet that some of you are perfectionists. If you've put yourself into the category of being a perfectionist, uh, put a why in the chat for that. I would guess that at least somebody here is going to own up to this besides me. Oh, Roger. Well, thank you, Roger, for participating. 
we were just chatting earlier about making sure that all my slides were perfect. And he was identifying with that. And Chris says, yes. And Journal My Journey says, yes. Great name for a, a Zoom participant. Life's Pleasure says, yes. All right, I'm resonating with some of you. And Anita, Anitas and Mike, great. If it's not perfect, I can't publish it. Uh, I, I just need to make sure that it's absolutely the best representation. Well, that's one of the reasons why Cindy Hartner's book that I've been holding up for you sat on her hard drive for 15 years. She finally spoke to Diane Boover, who then talked to me and I edited Cindy's book for her. She was afraid that it wasn't perfect. It wasn't good enough. Think about all the people that she could have helped in those 15 years who dealt with sudden loss. It's not a topic that goes away. We all can have experiences with sudden loss of any, many kinds. But she held herself back because she didn't think it was good enough. But it's out. That's the good news, that it's out. And another common question, common response that I got was, I don't know if I have the time to write a book. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I can fit that into my life. Some people write books that are in, done in little chunks based on when they know they're most productive. Like you know from your patterns, are you most resourceful, most creative first thing in the morning? Are you more alight, awake and attuned to doing that kind of work in the evening? Some people devote a weekend and they work on their book every weekend for a segment of time to get it finished. There are ways to get this into your life so that you then have that opportunity to share your knowledge in a way that makes sense for you. There is another way to deal with this, which is to work with a ghostwriter. Greg Williams came to me about three years ago and asked me to help him with ghostwriting his book. He wanted to write a book on body language secrets to win more negotiations. We worked together on that book. Then the publisher came back to him and said, we would like you to write a book on negotiating with a bully. So the first time the agent approached the publishing company, the second time with the second book, the publishing company went to Greg and said, we think this is gonna be a hot topic. We want you to put this book together. So we worked on both of these together. And then just a couple of months ago, he called me up all excited because he opened up a package in the mail that had a Chinese translation of his book. He had no idea it was even being done. What I would like to leave you with is uh, some tips for improving your writing skills. And I mentioned to you at the beginning of this program that we had a link that is a place where you can go to get this ebook. This is http colon forward slash forward slash lnc dot tips forward slash w r a w. This is a ebook that is an immediate download that will give you an opportunity to take a look at your writing skills and determine if they are ones that need a little polish. There are some tricks and some simple techniques that I share in this book to help make your writing sparkle. And if you've got questions about writing, I mentioned my podcast, Writing to Get Business. I interview people every week who have written nonfiction business books, and we talk about the process that they went through, and they share their secrets for what helped them in their quest to become authors. I can also offer you opportunities to ask me questions by using my email of patriciaeyer at gmail.com. And let me check the chat, Roger, before we move on and see if there are any other questions. 
Okay, looks like we are good. Um, Amazon KDP is wonderful. Uh, they do provide a terrific service. And Life's Pleasure said, I thought about hiring a ghostwriter, although I would really like to be the sole writer. Perfect. And Natalie's asking for the link in the chat. I'm not sure what link you're referring to, Natalie. Maybe um, you could add another comment in and I will be able to interpret that or maybe that's directed to somebody else. Uh, Pat, uh, Ashok is asking, uh, what are the disadvantages and I guess advantages of publishing a book with an alias in a different name? Um, a pen name is what you're referring to when you say an alias. Is that right, Ashok? Uh, some people prefer... If, if, if my company doesn't allow me to write a book, but I want to write a book, so I will go the route of alias. But if I'm writing as an alias, what am I losing is my question. You know, that's an interesting question, Ashok, because I would wonder why the company wouldn't want you to write a book because it would bring them some recognition, some publicity, some benefits of having a published author as part of their staff. That's, that's their policy. They cannot change it for me. Well, <laughs> uh, Ashok is in the financial services industry, which is super uh, really regulated in Canada. Uh, okay. And do you want to write about a financial topic, Ashok? Yes. Or is how, how money works instead of you working for money. Hmm. I have run into the concept of the financial services being highly regulated. I've talked to other people in the industry. Wow, Roger, that, that is a tough question, Ashok. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any insight, Roger, on what Ashok could do. Yes, you could do it under a pen name. Naturally, then it would be difficult for you to promote the book using your name and your image and your existence because you would be tied back to the company. You can't do anything anonymously if you are promoting a book with your face and your name, if you're doing it under a pen name, still somebody's gonna recognize you in your industry. I was uh, talking to somebody and she suggested that I quit my company and put my book in my own name. She asked you to put your book in your own name and what was the first part of that? Quit, quit. quit, quit my company. Yeah, if you are unemployed and then it's no reflection on your company or their policy, certainly you can do that. But I would recommend that you be sure you have alternative sources of income before you quit so that uh, you don't end up in financial trouble. Roger, do you want to add to this? Uh, I'm afraid it's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Anita says he, he should speak with a lawyer. Uh, let's come back to that, Ashok, if we have more time at the end. Thank and you. And also, I would recommend, I've got my email on the screen. I would be happy to communicate with you through email about this. I think you're asking a broader question then we might have time to address today. And it's a serious question that I'd like to be able to help you with. Let me go on now. And we've been talking about the motivation for writing a book, the support that you need, the rewards for writing a book. I would like to share with you an opportunity to go deeper with me to help flesh out the idea for your book and get it finished. I put together a course called Get Your Book Finished. I've taught it three times so far, and I'm offering you the knowledge that I can bring to you as a person who has written several books, the knowledge of the people in the group who have that desire to write books and perhaps have written some books, 
and the support that you need in order to be able to move through this process. I don't want you to get caught up in Cindy's situation where for 15 years you had that book that you wanted to write and you were held back. The course gives you feedback as well. You get knowledge, support, and feedback as a result of being part of this group. Laura Conklin, who went through the course, said that I helped her focus on all the little things that make a difference because you don't think of them when you pick up a book. Laura started off with a plan to write a memoir. She did this in the opposite um, order that Pamela did. She first wrote her memoir about her experiences as a nurse for 50 years. And then she wrote her second book on cases that she reviewed as an expert witness for the Board of Nursing in Michigan. The Board of Nursing is the regulatory body that protects the public from incompetent nurses. On a different topic, Melanie Balestra, who is an attorney, wrote a book about her adult daughter's suicide. She wanted, as her motivation for writing the book, to help parents of children who were suicidal so they would recognize the signs and they would understand what Melanie went through with her daughter and how they could apply those lessons and experiences to their own lives. We go through a step-by-step -step process in this course to take you from the idea to the completion. It eliminates the risks, the risks of, I don't know what to say, I'm not sure my topic is right, is anyone gonna to wanna to buy this book? It takes you through this course so that you understand how to proceed and move ahead with the most success. This is a course that's for you if you finally want to write your book. You are ready, you're committed. You say 2021 is the year in which I'm going to write my book. You wanna build a bigger platform. Maybe that's a platform within your corporation, within your business, within your job position, you're looking for those opportunities that come with being an author of a book. And you want somebody to guide you through this experience. You want the assistance to make sure that you get this accomplished and that you're proud of the result. This is not a course, however, if you want to write fiction or poetry or children's books. Those are not my areas of expertise. I am solid on writing nonfiction books, medical books, business books. Those are my experiences. And if you don't want to put in the work, if you would prefer somebody else write your book, that's a ghostwriter. If you don't want to or you can't dedicate yourself to writing this book at this time in your life, this is not the right course for you. This course is done over a series of steps, as I mentioned, a step-by-step -step process. The first step is to be part of a jumpstart weekend in which we come up with a plan for your book to help you outline what it is you want to cover, who you want to write for, who's your ideal audience, who are, what are the competing books on the market so that you can move forward with confidence as we progress. There are also, after that Jumpstart Weekend, which is the last weekend in January, we also meet every other week on a Thursday evening to have check-in sessions. On those sessions, I teach you a little bit more about the process at each of the sessions. Envision sitting in a class for eight hours, even by Zoom, for eight hours, three days in a row. If I taught you everything you needed to know, you would end up walking away with your head being so full you couldn't absorb it. The Jumpstart Weekend is to teach a little bit, give you a writing exercise, teach a little bit more, give you another writing exercise. And then in the check-in sessions, we as a group go further through the process. You're doing that with other people who are in the course. Those sessions are valued at 1500. And then the tips sheets the templates, the step-by-step -step action guides are documents that I share with you based on being the author or the editor of, of almost 50 books 
the shortcuts that you need, the things that I've used and I still use in my practice when I write books so that you get additional support in the format of those documents. The recordings are also valued at 2,500. You have lifetime access to those recordings. You can go through and repeat, review those videos. We also get the sessions transcribed so you can look at the transcripts to quickly find information that will be relevant for you. And then there's a secret Facebook group consisting of other people who've gone through this course. You'll join them. You'll have an opportunity to get feedback from them as well as the other people who are in your group. I give you physical copies of my books. These bonus books are paperback books. The 52 writing tips gives you those steps that you need to polish your writing. And the How to Get Published book goes through the publishing process, working with co-authors, co-editors, getting your book together to get it published. As a bonus, I offer something that is unheard of. I give you unlimited consults with me, meaning we get on Zoom or a phone at a time that's convenient for both of us. And you say, here's my question, Pat. I don't want you to feel stuck in any way. Those are 15 minute consults. You can have as many of them as you need as we go through this process of getting your book done. And they're valued at 1500. And the link that has been showing up on the slides is the link that takes you to the course page where you can sign up. The total value of all of those components is $10,038.97. I do know people who charge $10,000 for you to go through a book coaching program with them. I was in uh, PodFest in Orlando in uh, March of 2020, the last weekend that anyone was attending live conferences. And I met a woman who offered a book coaching program. She was in the exhibit area for $10,000. However, that is not the price of the course that I'm offering to you. It is $2,000 as a single pay, those are US dollars, or three payments of 750 one month apart. And that course is available at lnc.tips forward slash VBN. I have for you right now as an early bird discount, an offer of $200 off of that single pay of 2000 or the three payments of 750 one month apart by putting in the coupon code of EB200 in the shopping cart you will have an opportunity to get the course at a $200 off discount that makes it a single pay of 1800 or three payments of 683 and the code again is EB200 to put into the shopping cart. And there is a time limit. That deadline for completing the purchase is tomorrow, January 15th at 1159 p.m. Eastern. That would be 859 p.m. Pacific time. And you can make the adjustment depending upon where in the world you are after that. So let me see, Roger, let me share the dates of the weekend. And that is January 29th, 30th, and 31st. That's the last weekend this month. And then the check-in dates are Thursday evenings. They are at 7 p.m. Eastern, which would be 4 p.m. Pacific, February 11th and 25th, and March 11th and 25th and then April 8 and 22. And let me see if um, there are questions, Roger, that are in the chat that I have not addressed. If you've seen anything nope. that I need to pay I, attention to. I haven't observed any questions. You've been very thorough in your description. Well done. Okay, perfect. Uh, I see a private question to me. I'm gonna save the chat so I can respond to that individual. Great. And Pat, we're at running a little bit over time. 
So okay. uh, I would like to thank you very, very much on behalf of Vancouver Business Network and our 19 brothers and sisters in the Entrepreneurs International uh, Network uh, family. Uh, I have uh, listened to many speakers talk about uh, people gaining credibility and authority as a result of writing a book. Uh, your description has been exceptionally clear to the point and uh, everything relevant uh, on, on, on all our behalfs. I, uh, there's now 54,000 members in that Entrepreneurs International Network family. So on behalf of us all, I want to thank you very, very much for sharing your decades of experience with us and for the generosity of the offer that uh, you made. I, I recognize that that's exceptional value for what people are going to get. So Pat, thank you very, very much. Roger. And my last word would be to, to take the words to heart of Nike of just do it. Don't let that book stay trapped in your head, get it into somebody's hands, take the step, take the action. Great, thank you so much, Pat. Thank you, Roger. Enjoy the rest of your program with Roger. Great, thank you. You're welcome to stay stay with us if you want. If you want. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>